Janam Jana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tashmai Sri Gurave Nama Nama Shrestam Manumapi Satchiputram Matra Sarupam Rupam Tasha Grajamuru Purim Matrim Gashtavatim Radha Kundam Giri Boram Maho Radhika Madhavasam Rabdo Yasya Pratita Gripaya Sri Gurum Tamnadasmi Vancha Kalpataru Yasya Gripa Sindhu Bhai Vacha Patita Nam Pavane Pyo Namo Namaha Nikila Shruti Mali Ratnamala Dutti Nirajita Padapanka Janta Haji Mukta Kulai Rupashamanam Paritas from Harinam Samsayami Anare Pitacharim Tirat Karunaya Vatirna Kalu Samar Paitamun Natoch Balarasam Swabhakti Shriam Hari Purata Sundara Duty Kadamba Sandi Pita Sadari Dai Kandaresh Purato Vasachinandana Ajanulambita Bujo Kanaka Vadato Sankirtanai Kapitaro Kamalaya Takshu Vishwambharo di javaro jugadharma balo Vande jagat priyakaro karuna vataro 
लादिनी शक्ति स्वरूपाय गौरांग सुहृदाय भक्ता शक्ति प्रादनाय गाधर नमस्तुते हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधो दीन बांधो जगातपते गोपेश गोपी का कंत राधा कंत नमस्तुते राधे वृंदवनादिशे करुणावाहिने कृपाया निज पाद दस्यान्म प्रदीयुत भक्तियाक्षिताखमादितरंगे कृपा मै तम शरण प्रपानम वृंदे नमस्ते शरणारविंद वृंदे नमस्ते शरणारविंद श्रीला गुरुदेव की श्रीमन महाप्रभु की श्री हरिनाम संकीर्तन की जय श्री श्री गौर गधाधर जी की जय श्री राध गोविंद की जय ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवत की जय श्री ब्राह्म स्तुति की तिर बाब महोत्सव तीर्थ श्री लक्ष रखा अक्षर देव गोस्वामी महाराज की जय गौर भक्त वृंद की जय गौर प्रेमानंद Good morning, Pranam to all of you. Welcome. Thank you so much for <coughs> your company and association. <coughs> you are more than fifty percent at this time of the retreat. You are doing like ninety-nine percent, basically, and just out of out of ritual speaking, open my mouth one percent and trying to do also, something. Only one percent, you said. Yeah. So we earn one percent more, then you are free. Yeah, in two days I'm leaving, so you have what two more days to capture the remaining one percent. <laughs> so today we are continuing with the prayers of of Brahmas we have been doing during the mornings mostly. Today we will be studying verse number thirty-three of the Brahma Stuti, very interesting shloka, very beautiful prayer. <coughs> But as usual, we will make some brief summary of yesterday's verse, verse 32, in which Brahma is in Aho Bhagyam, Aho Bhagyam, Nanda Gopa Prajokasam, Janmitram Paramanandam, Purnam Brahma Sanatanam. He will say, How fortunate, how fortunate, Aho Bhagyam, Aho Bhagyam. A fortunate are the people of the of the cowherd village of Nanda Maharaj, because he who is a complete Brahman and the direct embodiment of condensed bliss now has become their dear friend, the eternal friend, for Sanatana. So somehow we could say that that's the most. This is the most important verse of the whole Brahma Stuti. From different perspectives, we could say different verses are the most important verses. My Gumras recently was given a lecture in Poland. In one temple, he was invited to speak, where the deities were Pancha Tattva. <coughs> so his lecture was about who of these five is the most important member of the Pancha Tattva. <laughs> so that was kind of the title. So everyone was like, let's see. But he gave the lecture in such a way that he showed that all of the five can be considered the five the most important, depending on which perspective you analyze them. <laughs> Similarly, we can say this, this is the most important verse, but from other perspective, we could say this other is the most important yeah. verse, and so on. Today is the most important day of our life. Exactly. <laughs> and if we, if we survive such an important day, maybe tomorrow will be the most important day, <laughs> <laughs> and so on. So, in these verses, we know Brahma is expressing his, his specific affinity in the direction of Sakya Bhav. In previous verses, he already said "aho," which is an expression of wonder. But in this verse, he's saying "aho" twice. "Aho bhagyam, aho bhagyam." Not today's verse, but yesterday's verse. We're doing summary. 
expressing this chamatkar, this astonishment, considering the good fortune of the Brajabhasis, which according to Brahma is anirvachaniya, which is indescribable. It's impossible to put it in words, but somehow he's trying to say something. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Glorifying the domain of Braj is the land of friendship. We mentioned that one general idea of that verse, bring down is the land all pervaded by friendship. Mm-hmm. But especially for Brahma, he wants eternal friendship with Krishna, and he considers this eternal friendship, Sanatana Mitram, is Paramanandam, is the greatest bliss. Mm-hmm. That's his particular experience. Mm-hmm. So when he's saying, how lucky are these boys, actually Brahma is saying, how lucky I am mm-hmm. to have the chance of joining them, to have that ideal, at least. And that's why Krishna is Purna Brahman. Mm-hmm. Because we hear about Brahman, the Absolute. But here, Bra- Brahma is calling Krishna Purna Brahman, the most complete form of the Absolute. Why? Because the, the Brahman in general is Nirvishesh, no qualities, no lila, no associates, lacking so many of those things, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> but when you go to Purna Brahman, it has to be Nam, Guna, Rupa, Lila, Parishad, overflowing with all this and full of sweetness. No? Lila Madhurya, Rupa Madhurya, Venu Madhurya, and so on. Mm-hmm. And we also spoke how one definition of Brahman is he who increases expanding, or expands. So this is a very Gaudiya concept. No? Our Brahman is constantly the same, but at the same time is evolving and changing on the basis of that permanent situation, if you will. His permanent situation is constant evolution, <laughs> but in the context of Brahma. Hmm? So here Brahma is not praying directly for Sakya Baba, I want to be a Gopa, but he's praising those who have what he wants to have. And in this way he shows reverence for the Ragatmikas. No? He, wa- he shows some respect for those who are the role model to follow in Raga Bhakti. Hmm? So in that context, we we explain this famous line from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. My Guru Maharaj also said something yesterday. It was not planned; it just came. Pujala Raga Bhata Gaura Bhange Matala Hari Jana Vishaya Range. How he will say, if you want to attain that goal, you offer, you have all reverence not for Krishna and Vrindavan, but for that type of love. You appreciate that from some distance, worship that ideal, and by that worship gradually whatever distance is there will disappear and you will become one of them. Mm-hmm. That was his approach, if you will, to the Raga Mark. Mm-hmm. Raj, just one little... Maybe you can comment on this. <clears throat> Many persons use this verse of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta mm-hmm. mm-hmm. as, okay, the path of Raga Bhakti. We just mm-hmm. have... We adore it above our heads. Mm-hmm. And we just... This is too high, mm. and actually, it's nothing for us. Mm. So they use it, mm. but actually, how Bhakti Zidane Sarasvati Thakur using it is by having extreme adhar, gorava, like extreme adoration mm-hmm. to them. Mm. This is the part of Raghunuga Bhakti Sadhana. Mm-hmm. So some use the same verse as saying, No, Raghunuga Bhakti is not for, is us. Not for us. And Pro- so much. Actually, this is the path of Raghunuga. To Bhakti. confirm, this is it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Primaras niryasa korite ashvadam raga marga bhakti loke korite prachanam. That's what Mahaprabhu came to give. So if we are gold, yes, that's our path. And so yeah, I, I, I'm aware that in some cases that's that's it how some interpret this verse. But Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta, there's this famous lecture he gave from Anartani Vritti to Artha Prabriti. Have you heard that one? <laughs> From Anartha Nivriti to Artha Prabriti. So Anartha Nivriti means like getting free from the unwanted things. And Artha Prabriti means attaining that which is totally desirable. Prabriti. Yeah. It's a very nice lecture he gave at Radha Kun, at the shores of Radha Kun. And he will say, well, for many days we have been speaking about other topics, because Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta was famous for speaking at Radha Kund about Prahlad Maharaj, <laughs> Upadeshambrita, first verses. 
<coughs> so everyone was like, why not Bilab Kosamanjali? Where is Ratharasa Sudhanidhi? <coughs> and he will go to the basics. Now, to make a point, if you want this, first go through that. It's not denying that the ideal, but just making sure we are not just jumping without proper foundation. But in this lecture he says, but actually the goal of our life is not just an art and ibriti, to clean our hearts, but to render service to Radha and Krishna 24 hours in the context of Astaka Lila Lila. So I will speak today about that, he said. So that, and, and he gives this inter- in lecture as an introduction, like if we spend all our lives saying, this is my, the rejecting Maya, if you will, neti neti, if, if there is too much neti neti, you may end up in Nirvishesh Brahman. <laughs> because that's the exercise of the jnanis. No, this is not Brahman, this is not Brahman, this is not Brahman. Brahman. <laughs> so Gaudias, we are not so much about what it, this is not, this is not, but what it is. No, in a positive immortality, as we spoke. So yeah, when, when he said, we worship the Raga Marg, is, I mean, if you worship something, I mean, you don't worship something that you don't want to attain. <coughs> Techni- ideally, <it's laughs> something that you worship is something you, you, you aspire to attain. Maybe you don't feel you can just jump into that in one second because it's so valuable. But still, it, it's your idea. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the point that Prabhupada Bhaktisiddhanta wanted to make. We worship that. We put it above our heads. All that in place. So everything is in place for us to gradually get closer to that point and gradually enter there forever. I mean, he's he's speaking from that side. I mean, he's one of them. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks so much for adding that. So basically, just to conclude my summary, um, then Brahma is praising the Gopas, the Ragatmikas, whose whose bhakti, as we say yesterday gives form to Krishna's form. Remember we spoke about this idea? Krishna's form is carved out of the love of his devotees. Mm-hmm. And although in this, in this verse, Brahma, uh, Brahma seems to present an incompatible expression, like referring to the Purna Brahman as a friend, it sounds a little bit like Upanishadic language on one side, and on another side so much intimacy. Jiva Goswami says, that may sound as Rasa Bhas, but actually it is called Rasa Ulas which is great exaltation in, 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 in Rasa. Mm-hmm. Also, we explain some words about how, why Brahma probably, he could he mentioned Sakya after Vatsalya. Now remember, he spoke about Vatsalya before, then Sakya, but Rupa Goswami generally puts them in the other order, Santa, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya. But here Brahma spoke Santa, Dasya, Vatsalya, Sakya. Oh, of course, many reasons are there. One is the ideal of Brahma, Sakya. But also we spoke the variety of Sakya called Priyanarma Sakya reaches a, in, reaches a high gate point of ecstatic experience that Vatsalya do not reach. Mahabhava. Mm-hmm. Interestingly. So in that sense we could say Sakya, that type of Sakya is about Vatsalya and that could open a window probably Brahma hunkers after that. Mm-hmm. Krishna Chandra Prabhu yesterday shared this important insight that in Brahma Samhita, Brahma is speaking, he's aware of the gopis, if you will. And, and, and not only about the gopis, but about their connection with Krishna. And that's only, who, who are the only friends that are aware of that? Priyanarma Sakas. So we, can, we have arguments to make a case <laughs> of Brahma for being a Priyanarma Sakya. <laughs> And of course, Brahma said, and the wonderful thing with this friendship is that it is eternal. Mm. It's not a friendship that can begin and end, like today we are accustomed. We had one new friend to Facebook. Mm. I added her the other day. Huh? Hopefully it doesn't happen, but sometimes you can delete your friend from Facebook also. So the friendship is over. <laughs> That's the sense of friendship of nowadays. But Brahma says, Sanatanam. This friendship is eternal. Mm-hmm. And therefore, if friendship is eternal, Krishna's friends must be eternal. Because Krishna is the object of friendship. There is friendship which is eternal, 
there is the object of friendship which is eternal, so there must be friends who are eternal. Vishaya Lambana, Asraya Lambana, everything is eternal. So yesterday we saw that. And, and let's go to today's verse, where Brahma will, after saying this main statement, now he continues reflecting about not only the good fortune of the Brajabasis in the previous verse, today's verse he will reflect about his own fortune, Brahma's own fortune as well. Mm-hmm. But also that in relation to the Brajabasis' good fortune. He will make that point. I am fortunate because they have such a fortune, somehow I am in connection with them, so I am fortunate. Mm-hmm. So let's go to today's verse, verse number 33. Mm-hmm. So let's as we put the Raga Mark above our heads, let's put yes. the Bhagavatam <laughs> above our heads as well. <laughs> so I'll, I'll recite the verse once and then if you want you can recite it along all together. This is in Basanta Tilak, Chanda, a particular meter called Basanta Tilak. It says like this. Isham tu bhagya mahima chita tavadastam Ekadasai bahi vayam bata bhuri bhaga Etadrishika chasakaira sakrit pi bama Sarvada yangri yuda jama dvamrita savanti Esam tu bhagya mahima chuta tavadasam Ekadasai bahi vayam Pata Bhuri Bhaga Etadrishika Chasakai Asakrit Pivama Sarvata Yongryu Dayama Gwamri Sadamte. It's okay, very good. A little bit more complex meter than others, no problem. So I'll read the translation hmm, for all of you. It says like this. Brahma refers to Krishna as Achyuta. So he says, Oh Achyuta, there is no need to say more about the extent of the inconceivable good fortune of the residents of Raj. They will say, Ah. Oh. In between he says that. Ah. Oh. We, eleven presiding deities of the various senses, and headed by Shiva, are also most fortunate. Because the senses of the Brajavasis are the cups, the cups through which we repeatedly drink the nectarian intoxicating liquor of the honey of your lotus feet. Yeah. Never ends. <laughs> <laughs> Nectar and intoxicating liquor of the honey of your lotus feet. <laughs> so that's today's verse. Amazing. Amazing. Oh. oh. <laughs> he won't use the word aho oh here, but there's one word which is bata in the second line. We will see that's basically like a synonym with aho. Oh. I was reading today one translation of the verse and one translation put the word but as hallelujah. <laughs> so we can have that version if you want. If you have some Christian sensibilities, you can have like hallelujah. <laughs> so let's go to the word by word of the verse. I will repeat and then you can con- repeat with me. Isham Isham of these. Now with this he's referring to the residents of Braj. No, he has been speaking about them. To, to however, however Bhagya, Bhagya of the good fortune. Of the good fortune. Mahima, Mahima the glory. The glory. Achyuta, Achyuta, o infallible one. Tavat that much. That much. Astam. Astam. Let it be. Let it be. Ikadasha. Ikadasha. Eleven. Eleven. Ivahi. Ivahi. Indeed. Indeed. Bayam. Bayam. We. We. 
भूरि भाग आर मोस्ट फोर्चुनेट एथ ऑफ दीज रिफरिंग टू दे ब्रज बासिस ऋषिका बाय द सेंसेस चाशकाई व्हिच आर लाइक ड्रिंकिंग कप्स आसक्रित रिपीटेडली पिबा महा वी ड्रिंक सर्व आदाय headed by sarva which is another name for shiva angri udaja of the lotus feet madhu dehani amrita asavam which is an nectarian intoxicating liquor which is a nectarian intoxicating liquor which is a nectarian intoxicating liquor 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 which is a nectarian intoxicating liquor <laughs> okay okay the clouds are creating some influence and no problem oh okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just by <laughs> de hey. your your that was easy okay <laughs> anyhow so that's a word by word of this verse in which brahma again is saying to, <coughs> to referring to krishna satyuta infallible one i'm basically saying there's no need to stop to continue speaking about the fortune of the brajavas like saying there are no words to describe that that's too much mm-hmm. so let's turn to me and other in my category to some devas the presiding deities of the senses we are also most fortunate but he said my our fortune is because of the good fortune of the brajavasis because through the cups of the senses of the brajavasis we the presiding deities of the senses <coughs> are drinking the nectar and intoxicating liquor of the honey sweet of your lotus sweet basically So <clears throat> let's begin with my Guru Maharaj's commentary on this verse called Bhakti Vedanta Bhava Anubhat and then we will continue as usual with the different tikas of our purvacharyas. <clears throat> so my Guru Maharaj says then in continuation with the previous verse then continuing to glorify the cowherd community Brahma states that at times such as when during the prakat lila lila on earth Krishna returns home with his friends from cow herding the devas presiding over the senses tastes something of the bliss of raj through the senses they preside over but in connection to the cowher boys they themselves taste the highest bliss with all of their senses at all times so the idea here is that brahma is praising his good fortune in connection to the good fortune of the brajavasis but at the same time making clear their good fortune is without comparison mm-hmm. so again it seems he's praying his own good fortune but at the end he's praising the brajavasis ultimately mostly <clears throat> and we will explain today more why why this is being said here not that when krishna is returning in the afternoon with his friends and the cows generally the, the, the devas will appear in vrindavan and witness that that parade if you will so through through witnessing that they are drinking 
the nectar, the liquor of the darshan of Krishna, his associate, his pastimes, and so on. So again, Brahma is not able to put in words the good fortune of the Brajavasis. Mm. He just collapsed saying, Aho, 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 on. <coughs> Lost and found in an ocean of Ahos. No? Something like this. Okay. <laughs> Some intoxicating <laughs> beverage? Yes. <laughs> 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 so if you notice some differences in my catapter I drink this glass it's just mere coincidence <laughs> <laughs> it's streamed online so everyone knows already <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so we could say here Brahma is um, unable to say more about the good fortune of the Brajavasi so somehow he turns to himself to, to say something about that Maybe I can say something about my good fortune. But he cannot avoid speaking about his good fortune in relation to the good fortune of the Rajavasis. You follow? He, he now has a, good, a new sense of what does it mean to have good fortune. Because we, all, we always may think, oh, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate. But when you discover another level of fortune, you realize, oh, now I'm fortunate. I was not fortunate. I thought I was fortunate. This is fortunate. And all this can happen in, on a material level in so many layers. And Brahma occupies the highest material layer. And he said, I thought I was fortunate being Brahma. Thought most post imaginable in, in uni the universe. And now he said, now I'm realizing what's real fortune. So now I can say more strongly, I am fortunate. <laughs> Not by my own strength, but by their fortune that generally, generously is being extended to me. So again, yes. An important question, shortly. Um, according for this verse, because Brahma is like seeing this. Uh, that is eleven deities of the senses. Of course, he is the sum total of all the devas and normally if I experience something actually it's a deva of the senses who is experiencing that for every day for every sense there's a deva responsible and that's why my sense is also working without this deva the sense wouldn't even work mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so and that's why when we sing kirtan for example this deva feels oh my god now I get some blessing also mm -hmm. because <coughs> I'm the responsible of the senses get in touch with mm -hmm. the divine mm -hmm. but these are the eternal associates of the Lord and they don't have devas in their senses I'll speak about it in a few minutes ah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. That is, it's, part, it's, it's, it's part of the plan okay. Okay, but I like that he cannot contain and he <laughs> <laughs> I respect that he's telling okay and he's not forcing me. Speak now about that now. <laughs> a few minutes, a few minutes. Or a few hours, we'd never know. Utsavani <laughs> said Hariyat. Hariyat has to be there. No? Yesterday was saying the play, right? The, yeah. Yesterday, ja Jamaraj was? Who was who, the one? Yeah, Jamaraj was saying. So, the Hariyat means patience. Yeah. Rupa Goswami says in the Father Shambrita. Mm, third verse. Utsavani uh, Shayadara, you have to be enthusiastic, you have to make efforts with confidence, but you have to be patient. Because I say, you have to be enthusiastic. I say, okay, Maras, but, but I'm not enthusiastic. I cannot play, press a button, and I'm enthusiastic. So, Nishayat, then make some proper effort with confidence, and enthusiasm will come. Okay, Maras, but I'm doing and it's not happening. So Rupa Goswami says, Thayriya, patient, wait. <laughs> okay, I'm so trying please, to please, exercise. Yeah, try, try. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can do it. <laughs> I mean, at one point it's good to lose patience also. <laughs> there is place for divine impatience as well. So let's see how much Krishna Chandra Prabhu can deal with this. <laughs> so again, Brahma is expressing his own fortune by saying the 
supremely fortunate Brajabhasis. I always like to make a play of words with the word supreme. Because supreme is su prem. No? So you have prem. And in Sanskrit, su means like a lot. Like su durlabha, su whatever, something. The supreme is lots of prem. No? So we worship the supreme. No? Supreme personality of Godhead, which is God surrounded by full prem. No? Prem Madhurya. So that's the supreme. <laughs> you want to make a play of words. No? So, so Brahmas appreciate in this Brajabas are supremely fortunate, which means they are adorned by a very special type of love. <laughs> Anyhow, <clears throat> let's let's start with or continue with the commentary of Sridhar Swami Pat, hmm? his Babarta Deepika. <clears throat> so he will say that the initial implication of Brahma's statements, the very first part, is the following. Brahma is saying, let them, let the Brajabhasis, and especially the Gopas, let them have such a glory of so much good fortune. Who can describe it? No? So that's the very beginning of the verse, according to Sri So let, be, let them be as fortunate as they are. What can we say about that? That's too much. That's way beyond my head. <laughs> but again, but I want that. <laughs> <laughs> and then Brahma here says, according to Sridhar Swami, how amazing that we, he uses the word Bayam, so Bayam means we, so he's including himself in the equation. Hmm? And Sridhar Swami says that by Brahma including himself, he thinks highly of himself. Not, not in material pride, huh? but just highly in terms of fortune. Oh, I, I'm part of this group of 11 devatas. Now we will explain this more in detail. So I'm part of them. We. Okay, so he's saying we like, I'm also part of them. I'm receiving that fortune. Why? Because the, bra- the senses of the Brajabhasis mm-hmm. sometimes are compared with cups here. Try to follow the poetic analogy. They are speaking about drinking the nectar. So cups are required for receiving that, the container. So through the senses of the Brajavasis who are like cups, which is we drink the honey or the nectar. And when when he says three or when Brahma says we drink the honey, which is like nectar means that's sweet, that's relishable. But also he says it's liquor. Liquor? Liquor, which means it's intoxicating. So it has these two qualities. It's honey, which means it's relishable. Hmm? and it's liquor it's intoxicating of course try to remember we are not speaking about sweetness and intoxication as we know it here on this world <laughs> and, and he's referring what, what, where is that coming from? from your feet which are lotuses hmm? That's, we will then elaborate more about the idea of poetic analogy of Krishna's lotus feet and liquor emanating from his feet. <laughs> so the Siddhar Swami concludes mentioning, he said the following idea is, is given, intended. We, Brahma says we, we who have the conceit, you understand the word conceit? Of presiding over the senses, so we who have the conceit of presiding over the senses, we are successful. We are successful, although we are making use of only one particular thing. In other words, different devas are presiding over one specific sense. We will see some of them. Brahma is presiding over buddhi, for example. Hmm? Surya, yes, intelligence. Inter- Surya presides over the eyes, the sight. So he says, although each one of us, eleven, presides over one of these, hmm? somehow we are fortunate because <coughs> through that particular sense we we connect with the Brajavas experience that they have of you, whether it's sight, speech, fragrance. So it's not the sight, the cause of uh, seeing, but it's Surya, the cause of seeing. Yeah. 
we, we will explain that it's, it's, it's a compound of things. No, it's not, but yeah, the devas aren't required to, to experience that particular sight or whatever. But the conclusion is, if we are fortunate because of this, what is the fortunate of these Brajavasis? Again, and ultimately the Gopas, the friends of Krishna that Brahma is praising especially, who are making use of all these different senses at all times in your service. So even when Brahma points to his own good fortune, he cannot but end up glorifying the fortune of the Brajavasis. Because his fortune is deriving from theirs. So. <laughs> but as we say yesterday, no, this is a nice exercise. You can appreciate the good fortune of others, but also that will go to back to you. Oh, I'm so fortunate by being close to the good fortune of others. Mm-hmm. And then you appreciate your good fortune and you like up, upgrade, refresh, that and you go back to others. Oh, how much good fortune they have! Oh, how much good fortune I have! Aho bagyam, aho bagyam. There is good fortune everywhere. So one nourishes the other. One appreciation nourishes other appreciation. Your own good fortune depends on the good fortune of the ones who are giving you good fortune, and so on. Let's go to Sanatan Goswami's commentary. He had. Lots of things to say, <laughs> very interesting ones, and hopefully, in part, that will help Krishna Chandra Prabhu to quench his thirst and divine impatience. <laughs> so we'll try to share that in, in his service. So, Sanatan Goswami begins paraphrasing Brahma uh, with the very first part of the verse again. He say, "Ah, no, this word bata is like ah, oh." Hallelujah! <laughs> he said, who at all can describe the glory of these people of Raj? Who can? Who dares to try to do so? <laughs> you have to be bold trying to do so. He has tried. He has tried his best. He's doing that pretty nicely, actually. <laughs> but still he feels I'm such a bold person trying to say something about this. is Again, millions of mouths, millions of years. Mm. So, even we, he's saying, we have become completely successful, we, these devas, simply by having some connection with these people. Mm -hmm. So, again, the the conclusion is, if we devas have fully become successful by a slight connection with them, what must be their good fortune? What must be their success? Then Brahma says to Krishna, he calls them Achyuta. Sometimes in Sanskrit two words appear together, but we have to separate them. Sandhi is here. So Achyuta. Achyuta means? Infallible. Mm-hmm. Infallible one, yeah. But also infallible can be, the word Achyuta can be connected to the, devo- the devotion, the bhakti of the Vrajabhasis. <coughs> so, here, according to Sanatan Goswami, and Mahima means glories. So he says, the, gl- the Ambhagya means great good fortune. So you can, with Sanskrit, you can play a lot and connect one word to, di- to different other words. So he's, here, Brahma implies the great fortune of your devotees, Brajavasis, is in all ways infallible. So he applies the word Achyuta not as a name for Krishna in this case but to qualify the good fortune of the Vrajabhasis. Their good fortune is infallible. And one could say, because you are infallible, they love you who are infallible, so their love to you is infallible as well, because the object of the love is infallible. Sometimes that's that's exactly what's not happening in this world. You try to love, to be as infallible as possible, (laughs) but the object of love, that you are reposing your love in is not infallible. So the whole experience fails at one point or another. So that's why it's so important to find a perfect object of love for the real ex- for the experience of love to be permanent, ever long, ever long, everlasting, eternal, sanatana. 
So Krishna is that Vishaya Lambana, the perfect object of love. Achyuta, infallible. So we can repose all of our feelings, emotions, hopes, thoughts, prayers. He will always reciprocate accordingly. So we could say like this, we could say, the devotion of the Brajavasis is infallible because you are infallible. Or, you are infallible because their love for you is infallible. <laughs> like a way in which Brahma is more inclined towards the Brajavasis now. Because their love for you is so infallible, therefore you are known as a Chitta. You eat the prasada, Radhika. Yeah. Th that's why you have some strength. That's you why you can leave cobra. That's why you can kill all this and so on. That's more Brajavasi like psychology. <laughs> and that's why you are known as infallible. That's your great fortune. That will be the idea. No? You are so fortunate, Krishna, because of the infallible love they have for you. Then you deserve the name Achyuta. Mm -hmm. But of course, in a more general way, we could say that, that the idea of Achyuta means that also Krishna never again, never fails to his devotees. Mm -hmm. That Someone is tempted there. Okay, no problem. So Krishna says in a famous verse in the Gita, mm -hmm. At the end of one of them, Name Bhaktiya Pranashati. Kauteya Pratiya Nihi, Name Bhaktiya Pranashati. So he tells Arjuna, declare it bold, boldly that my devotee never perishes. Hmm? Like I will be protecting him, I'm infall infallible. But the question may be in this connection, someone may ask, but why Krishna is asking Arjuna to say that? <laughs> Why Krishna doesn't say, my devotee will never perish? He's asking, you tell it. <laughs> and someone may ask, but why? Why don't you say that? And Krishna will say, well, <laughs> yes. Because sometimes Krishna has to break his vows to follow his most important vow, which is to always protect his devotee. So there is some background story in that connection regarding the Bhagavad Gita and the Kurukshetra War. I briefly mentioned that, with your permission or without it. <laughs> so as we know, Krishna made the vow, I won't participate in Kurukshetra apart from being a chariot driver. I won't fight. Hmm? So at one point of the battle, we know that Bhishma was on the other, on the Kuru side, and for Duryodhana, his whole success in, in battle depended on Bhishma. But we know Bhishma was the grandfather of the Pandavas. Mm. So he was inclined towards them. <laughs> so Duryodhana was always like, you know, doubt him how much Bhishma was actually on his side. So one day he suggested to Bhishma, it seems that you are attached to the Pandavas and you are not giving everything in battle for me. So you can imagine, you say that to a Kshatriya, mm -hmm. that is the is wounded pride is like... So, so Bhishma say, what? No, do you think that I'm just like co a coward or something like that? I'm not giving everything I can in battle? I promise to you that tomorrow I will kill the five Pandavas. I mean, although he doesn't want to do that, but there are so many things in between also. So I have five infallible arrows, Achuta arrows. <laughs> so I will use each one of them for each one of the Pandavas and all of them will be killed tomorrow. So you, that's what Duryodhana wanted to hear. Pandavas will be killed as soon as possible. So he was like, yes. <laughs> so, so Krishna, who is omniscient, especially here, he's not in Vrindavan here, so his omniscience comes more in the certain person. He heard all this conversation, and he was with Arjun, and he became concerned. Mm. So he tells something to Arjuna, he says to Arjuna, Upanishad, come closer. 
<laughs> you say some, whisper something to Arjuna's ears. Arjuna says, okay. Tatashtu. <laughs> and then Arjuna goes to Duryodhana's camp. Because the, the battle will last for a certain time during the day. But at a certain time, conch shell will sound. The day of battle is over. And sometimes during that break, the different members of the two uh, armies will meet each other and share. See you tomorrow, maybe I kill you. But now we can <laughs> drink, drink some kombucha together. <laughs> so Arjuna goes, and goes to visit Duryodhana's camp. So Duryodhana is surprised to see Arjuna coming. He says, Arjuna, well, what are you doing here? Well, I want to ask you something. Yes. Remember that once when we were young, I saved your life once? Mm. Many stories inside the stories. I'm making it short. And Duryodhana say yes. And you promise that whatever I may ask you, you will give, you will accept. And Duryodhana say yes. What do you want? That we stop the battle? No, no, I don't want that. Do you want this? Do you want long list? Do you want... No, no, I don't want that. And something that I forget to tell you, sorry. <laughs> when Bhishma taught Duryodhana about the five arrows, Duryodhana, Duryodhana was so crooked that just to guarantee that our Bhishma won't, be, won't repent of his decision, he told to Bhishma, give me the five arrows and I will take care of them till tomorrow. <laughs> and Duryodhana puts the five arrows below his pillow. Just, just in case Bhishma will change his mind. And no one knew. No one knew. So Krishna told something to Arjun. So you know. So Arjun is there. And Duryodhana, yes, whatever you want, ask me. So Arjuna says, I want those five arrows you have below the pillow. <laughs> so Duryodhana is like. <laughs> but he immediately knew Krishna. <laughs> now, Krishna is tricky even outside of Raj. <laughs> so you can imagine how was Duryodhana at this moment, no? So the next day comes and Bhishma goes to Duryodhana to ask for the arrows. <laughs> so Duryodhana is like... <laughs> and he tells the whole thing. <clears throat> so Bhishma... Bhishma is a great devotee of Krishna, of course. But also his devotion for Krishna is in in a Kshatriya language. No? There are famous series of prayers in which Bhishma prays for Krishna to be, when, when Krishna is... Anyhow, when they are exchanging in battle and he feels that in comparison to the loving battle between lovers and he, will, he longs for that type of exchange with Krishna. Yeah. So, <laughs> when Bhishma hears this, and he also, of course, knows this is Krishna, he said, I made a vow to kill the Pandavas today. And now Krishna wants me to break my vow. So, since he wants that from me, I will fight in such a way that I will force him to break his vow. Now Krishna's vow was, I will never participate actively in battle myself. So this is how in Kshatriya psychology you want me to break my bow? I will make you to break your bow. <laughs> so Bhishma started to fight in such a way without those five arrows, but terribly, intensely, so, so like threatening the whole Pandava's army. <laughs> and at one point he starts to attack Arjun. And there is a moment in battle when Arjuna is no longer able to counteract Bhishma's attack. So he's about to be killed by Bhishma. And remember, Krishna is in the chariot driving Arjuna. So he's seeing this situation. He's realizing Arjuna is to be killed. And I make this vow of not participating in battle. But to hell with my vow. <laughs> my higher vow is I will always have to protect my devotee. Bhakta Vatsalya, different forms. I think. So there's this, this different, this famous painting that Krishna takes one wheel from the chariot and he's approaching Bhishma like if it were a Sudarshan chakra or something. Uh, and Bhishma, who is a devotee of Krishna and who longs for that exchange, <laughs> Bhishma is like, 
receiving that. Good. Oh yes, please do it. <laughs> so Krishna, Krishna made Bhishma break his bow, and Bhishma made Krishna break his bow. Hmm. And that's why Krishna says in the Gita to Arjuna, "You declare that my devotee never perishes, because nobody will believe me. I'm always breaking my bows." <laughs> Outside of Raj, what to speak in Raj? That's another standard. <laughs> And there's something interesting because when he's about to kill Bhishma, Kanchal sounds. So it's the end of the battle day. So Bhishma is not killed by Krishna at all. And one story comes to my mind, if I may share with you. I was once speaking with one friend in Argentina. Because some years ago I gave like a series of studies on the Bhagavad Gita. And, he, and they were recorded, so he used to hear them. So he told me one day, Maharaj, I have to tell you something. And he was like, trembling almost. I said, what's going on? <laughs> Yesterday I was riding my bicycle. And I was hearing one of your lectures on the Bhagavad Gita when you were describing this same situation. And I, and I became so much inside the narration that I totally forgot about my external environment. And when you described that Krishna was about to kill Bhishma, and at that time the conch shell sounded, I heard like a loud noise appearing. <laughs> so it was the horn, the blow horn, of a big truck that just stopped here. Just about was about to be killed because I forgot about the cars. I was just like, Vroom. and just the moment you say the conscious sound, that this boom, the horn sound. Wow. And the other say, well, it would, and, and he concluded it would have been nice to leave this body while hearing Bhagavad Gita, but it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, long story to make this point about the Chitta. Krishna is infallible in, in protecting his devotee. That's another way. Let's continue with Sanatana Goswami's commentary. So he goes to the word Amrita Sabam, which means, refers to this Amrita Sabam like intoxicating liquor or nectar. So he said the, the liquor of Krishna's feet is nectar. Again, because of this... <laughs> <laughs> he found a good German word. Okay. Because of its great sweetness and because it gives life to the highest degree. R remember, Amrita can mean nectar, sweetness, or can mean give, deathless, give, giver of immortality. Mrityu, Mrityu is death, Amrityu means the opposite. Mm -hmm. and also, the, uh, here we have the word Asabam. Asaban, interestingly, asa means refers to pran, to life air. Asa. And asabam is plural, means a multitude of life airs. It's another way of saying giver of life. No? <laughs> something that gives you a multitude of life airs. <laughs> the Gopi sings something similar in the Gopi Gita yesterday. Krishna Chandra Pro was inviting us to that. I said, Tabakatamritam. Tapta jibonam kavi bhiriditam kalma sapaham shravanam angalam sri madatatam bhuvi grinanti ye bhuri dajana. Again, the word bhuri is coming there also. But the first line, Tavaka Tambritam Tapta Jivanam. To, to speak about you, the gopis are saying, dying in separation <laughs> gives new life to the souls in this world. So we are dying in separation, but we in separation sing about you, so our life returns. <laughs> Asabam. Multitude of life heirs are leaving us in separation, but multitude of life heirs are returning by invoking your remembrance. <laughs> hmm? So some words regarding that. Sanatana Goswami also will say, as you know, or, and he will give another possibility, 
The word Amrita also can refer, refer sorry, to those who are, are beyond death, to the Muktas, liberated souls. So liberated souls are called Amrita because they have no death. Amrita means no death. And he makes an important point. He says that the honey of Krishna's feet is liquor. In other words, it's highly intoxicating even for the liberated souls. So this is a classical bhakti post-liberated point. No? Bhakti is not about liberation. Bhakti is about post-liberation. Remember we spoke, I think, about that the first days. Our real question is not so much, how do I get liberated? But what will I do after liberation? <laughs> That's a bhaktiya sanjataya bhaktiya. Bhakti will take to further bhakti. Bhakti is the sadhana, bhakti is the sadhya. The practice and the goal. So, this lotus feet of Krishna is sweet and intoxicated even for those who are beyond death. No? One, main, uh, one main classical example of this is Sukadev Goswami. Atma ramas chamonayo nirgranta api urukrame kur bhantya hanitu kim bhaktim itam buthaku no hari. It's famous Atma Ram verse of the Bhagavatam. Mahaprabhu explained that in many ways. Sanatana Goswami, his Sarvabhoma in 18 ways. And then Sanatana Goswami asked him, I heard that you explained this verse to Sarvabhoma in different ways, 18 ways. Can you explain to me? Mahaprabhu said, I didn't know what I'd say that moment. I was crazy mad also, and I say something. But I can try to say something. <laughs> and then he goes to explain the verse 61 times without touching any of the first 18 forms of explanation. <laughs> Taking so much from this famous word from the Bhagavatam, which basically means, says, <coughs> the Atma Rams, or liberated self-satisfied souls, even them become attracted to Krishna's qualities. In a few, in a few words. Krishna's qualities are such that they attract even Atma Ramas, people who are self-satisfied. And again, the, the main example in the Bhagavatam is Sukadev Goswami. As we know, he went out of the womb after 16 years old in the womb, <laughs> it is said. He didn't want to go to the world. He was not interested in what's going on outside there. But once he went out, after 16 years old, he ran into the forest. He was not interested in getting entangled with anything. So he just disappeared into the forest. And as we know, then Vyasa ran after him, calling him, Jam Prabhajanta Manupitam Apeta Krityam Dvaipaya No Viraha Gata Juhava Putre Titam Mayataya Taravo Vinedus Tan Sarva Bhutta Hridayam Munitana Tvashmi Sipranamant to Sukadev Goswami, it would say that when Vyasa ran after him, he said, O oh son, O oh son, return, return, putriti. But only the trees reply with the echo of the voice, O oh son, O oh son, O oh. son. There are many explanations to this verse, it's another lecture also. <laughs> but the point is, Vyasa was running after Sukadev, not because he was an attached Grihamedi or anything like that. <laughs> But because he saw, he's a fit candidate for me to give the Bhagavatam to someone. He's a proper disciple. Oh, my Guru Mahesh likes to say, the disciples are looking for a Guru. Where is, where is my Guru? Where is my Guru? But the Gurus are looking for real disciples. Where is a serious person with whom I can share all the wealth of my heart? Where? 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 I, I, I so much in need to to do this, like what is the say, give me your years, please, I'm desperate. <laughs> <laughs> no? So, so the point is that Sukadev didn't return. But the only way Vyasa was able to catch Vyasa, Sukadev back, he, saw, he sent some disciples to the forest, they were going for bringing wood for the sacrifice. He gave them some, some verses of the Bhagavatam. I said, you recite these verses. That will act as some enchanting formula. Magic no? mantra. Yeah. <laughs> so they went to the forest reciting these Bhagavad verses. Some of them said some of them were Marhapidam, Nibrita Tarsheru, Pagiyamana, different verses. And, Vyasa, uh, and Sukadev, remember, nothing could attract him. Remember, he was naked, not attached even to a coping, a loincloth. 
But when he heard the Bhagavad, <laughs> he came like enchanted. No, like when the deer is called by the flute of the hunter, like hypnotized, oh, like in trance. And in this way, he returned to the ashram of Vyasa. No? And he sat, and I look at Vyasa like, tell me more. Those were only two, three verses. More, more. So then Vyasa poured the Bhagavatam to Vyasa to Sukadev. So the point with this is, even a liberated soul like Sukadev is attracted to this. Mm-hmm. And so Anatta Goswami said, because that honey, the nectar of Krishna's pastimes, gives greater happiness than liberation. Again, bhakti is above mukti. That's a very revolutionary statement. We may be accustomed to that. But that's very Gaudiya, very unique. In ancient ages, bhakti was seen just like something that could assist other practices. But here we say bhakti is the greatest practice and it is also the goal unto itself. <laughs> so it's so, it's, bhakti is so greater than liberation that you forget about liberation. Hmm. Sanatana Goswami says, drinking even once this honey... <coughs> shows the superiority of the people of Raj over all other devotees. So we are invited to drink this honey forever. That's how the Bhagavatam starts. The third verse of the Bhagavatam, which is the Ashirvad Sloka. This class may be relatively long today, it seems so. <laughs> the Bhagavatam has... Ma- M- Mangala Charan. We can cancel a few flights, no problem. <laughs> 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 this is another trip altogether. <laughs> so, Bhagavatam has Mangala Charan. Mangala Charan generally is composed of Asirbhat, Namaskar, and Bastra Nirdesh. Three ingredients, three types of verses. One in which is Pranam is offered to the deity of the book. That's the first word, verse of the Bhagavatam. Hmm? Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudhi and so on. Bastu Nirdesh Shloka is a book that points at the essential subject of the t- book, which is the second verse of the Bhagavatam, Dharma Prahito Kaita Votra. Again, each one of these verses requires one year of a whole series, only for each verse, something like that. And the third verse of the Bhagavatam is the Ashirvad Shloka, which gives the blessing. Now, what, what's the fruit of studying this work? So this is a very beautiful verse. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam sukad mukkadamrita dravasam yuktam pibhata bhagavatam rasam alayam. That's the line I want to go. Muhuraho rasika bhuvi bhavuka. So the third line, the Bhagavatam said, the, What's the blessing of studying the Bhagavatam? Pibhata. There's a similar word here, pibamaha. Now here is this verse today says pibama. The Bhagavatam said pibhata. Pibhata means to drink. The blessing of the Bhagavatam is Pibhata Bhagavatam Rasam Allah. Drink this juice called the Bhagavatam. This drink. Now because the verse is saying the, the Beda is a desired tree. So in a desired tree there are different fruits. And one fruit, and the highest fruit, the most ripe fruit, is the Bhagavatam. Which is like in liquid form. You don't even have to take out the peel or the seed. You can directly and drink it. And he says, Rasam, this is Ras, Alayam. Alayam means even up, up to the point if you reach liberation, even beyond liberation, you continue drinking that. So that's the blessing that the Bhagavatam is given. May you drink this juice in a post liberated state forever. So basically, that's the idea with Amrita Savan here. No? This nectar is to be drunk even beyond liberation. So we are drinking it now, but the goal of our drinking now is to continue drinking it, even in a better way, with more capacity. Huh? Like someone once asked Srila Prabhupada, what's the goal of chanting Hare Krishna? And he was kind of surprised with the question. He replied like in a very innocent way. He said, the goal of chanting Hare Krishna is to chant more Hare Krishna. <laughs> like, was there something else in your mind? He was wondering. <laughs> what else we want to do? So the goal of drinking Bhagavatam is to drink more Bhagavatam. <laughs> 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 
Mm. Okay, let's let's switch. One hour over, so after one hour, new turn. Okay. Do you need some water? No, no. Kombucha? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the translation needs some reviving elixir. So let's go to this idea that let's let's go to Krishna Chandra Prabhu's question some an hour ago or something. Sorry for having you waiting so much. So here Brahma is speaking about the sense deities. Remember these eleven deities. So here's an interesting point which we already spoke briefly, which is we don't see only because we have eyes. You know, the eyes do not see independently. If I take out my eye, I won't do it, no problem. <laughs> I put it there, the eye is not seeing anything. No? So there are other influences for the experience of sight to be accomplished. And one of them is that there are devas presiding on each sense, each one of the senses. Now, like I say, Surya is sitting on the eyes. Other way of putting it is if there is no sun, you cannot see anything. <laughs> There are different ways of putting this idea. <coughs> so only with the help of the devas, hmm, the, the, the senses can have some perception. Or we can have some perception through the senses. Because again, the senses in themselves are... Hmm. Another implication of this is, if the devas are sitting in our senses, whatever we do with our senses, devas are witnessing that. So be careful. <laughs> Whatever nonsense we are doing with the senses, <laughs> devas are witnessing that as well. In the same way, they are witnessing the prem of the Brajavasis. I'll get getting closer to Krishna Chandra's question gradually. No? And of course, we the question is, what do the Brajavasis do with their senses? No? They have senses, but they are spiritual senses and all of those senses are exclusively focused in Krishna's service. As we spoke the other day, in conditioned life the senses are obstacles to Krishna. That's why we have to do pratyahara. Yeah. <laughs> turtle. Turtle yoga. <laughs> all the limbs inside. But no, Atashri Krishna Namadi Nabhavet Grahyam Indriyai. No, with the senses you cannot attain Krishna nor his name. You cannot chant the name of Krishna with your tongue because the name is transcendental. But he says, Sebon Mukhehi Jiva Dosvayami Iba Spuratida. If you are touched by bhakti and you have an attitude of seva, those same senses become infused with bhakti, and through those same senses you can have an experience of Krishna. So the senses can be obstacles or can be facilitators. Mm-hmm. And we see the example of the Brajavasis. Oh, they use all their senses. They are not engaged in Pratyahara <laughs> and generally. They are like, it's a very sensual life. <coughs> but with Krishna as the center of that. Mm-hmm. So Sanatan Goswami will mention here, uh, we could say Ekadash means 11, one interpretation. So, we, here's, Brahma is speaking about 11 deities of 11 senses. So, Sanatana Goswami says, there are 10 deities presiding over this, the senses. There are what's called Karmendriyas and Gyanendriyas. The senses of acquiring knowledge are the senses of work. I, we won't enter into the definition now in detail, but the different senses and the hands and legs, genitals and so on. Mm-hmm. And the other sense, five senses that we already know. Sight, smell, touch and so on. Mm-hmm. No? In the Bhagavatam 2, 530, this description is given. Sanatana Goswami quotes that. Mm-hmm. And apart from these five senses, mm-hmm. there is a sixth sense, sometimes the mind. The, the moon is the deity of the mind, Chandra. So then, we, at that point, we have eleven senses. No? Five senses of perception, of action, acquiring knowledge, and the mind. 
So we could say, okay, so those are the 11 Brahma is referring. A Brahma is saying, Bayam here. So Bayam means we. So he's included in the list. But Brahma is the deity of intellect, which is not included in these 11. Hmm? Brahma is the deity of, and he mentions and others like Shiva, Sarva. <coughs> Shiva is the deity of Ahankar. So now instead of 11, we have 13. You follow my... Uh, and also if you want to add one more, is Chitta, another aspect of the subtle body. Ambasudev is the deity of Chitta. But here Basudev is not counted because Basudev is appearing in front of Brahma as Krishna. No. He ultimately Basudev is Krishna. So still we have 13. So how to understand why he's saying 11 here? No? Maybe he forget the other two out of ecstasy? <laughs> it can happen. <laughs> but Sanatana Goswami gives a variety of explanations for this. He said we should remove of these 13, we should remove two. We should remove Mitra and Prajapati. <laughs> because they preside of, of two senses, which are the genitals and the rectum, which are not in one sense directly useful in bhakti. <laughs> so if you take those two out, take those two out, then we have 11. <laughs> or he gives another option he says Prajapati which has to do with the genitals he can be useful somehow we can procreate Vaishnav children and he says that's direct bhajan to Bhagavan for the most part for the men and women who abide in Braj so there is place for that use so if we add him, then we have 12 again. So what to do with the, the extra one? <laughs> so he will go to a Pendra, which is one of the deities among the senses. The presiding deity of the feet. Upendra. Upendra. So he says, Upendra, Upendra in, that, in this case, Upendra shouldn't be counted. Because Upendra is an avatar of, of Krishna. <laughs> so he's not different from Vasudev. So we take him out and then we have 11 again. So you can pick the option you like the most. <laughs> but in that way, br the, the idea of 11 remains. <clears throat> but still the question of Krishna Chandra remains also. <laughs> Be because, okay, there are devas that preside over the senses, but the devas as we know them, they are material. But the senses of the Brajavasis are not material. So how can one re reside in, in, the, in the other? So Sanatana Goswami knows that Krishna Chandra Prabhu will make that question, so he will say something about it. <laughs> He says, although the Brajavasis, whose bodies are made of eternity, knowledge and bliss, such as Ananda, they have devatas in their senses. Those devatas are not the material moon, sun, and so on. Yeah, maybe you never heard this one. This is explained also by Jiva Goswami in the Sandarvas. There are devas in the spiritual world also. Mm. So Sanatana Goswami, he says this, these deities also have spiritual bodies and live in Vaikuntha. Mm. For Vaikuntha, he refers to the spiritual world. So, uh, in other words, the devas that we know here are just like a shadow representation of the original devas in Golok. Mm. Yes. <laughs> You can always learn something new. <laughs> Aho! <laughs> so Bra Brahma makes this statement suggesting that the material gods like him because Brahma is not one of the gods in Golok. He wants to enter Golok. And not as a deva, as a friend. <laughs> 
So Brahma makes this statement suggesting that these material gods are not different from their spiritual counterparts. In, ter in terms of being shadows of those who reside in Vaikuntha. Also, Brahma kind of compares to them in the sense, we are one, we are the shadow of them. I mean, we are not the ones, the same, but we are related somehow. <laughs> and then Sanatana Goswami quotes from Padma Purana verse that says basically that, that there are eternal devas in the spiritual world. And the devas here are material. And the last, uh, last part of Sanatana Goswami's commentary, he will give an alternative meaning, or he will say, in the, we could say that in this verse, Brahma is extolling the good fortune of the material devas, because somehow, now here and there, now and then, they are obtaining an experience of Krishna's sweetness. Like Brahma is experiencing at this precise moment. Now when Krishna descends on earth, performs Prakat Lila, the material devas can witness that on some level or another. So this is Anathan Goswami's commentary. You need some extra seat belt? <laughs> Not yet. Someone wants. <laughs> I still don't need that one. I'm, I'm okay now. Let's see. Someone needs you. You go there. Let's go to Sri Lajiva Goswami's commentary. Yes. yes. Uh, <coughs> With Vishwan Charitaku's commentary to the Bhagavatam, many times he mentions, like when Ras Lila is happening, ah. then these devas who throw flowers are not the material devas. Not even Lakshmi has access to Ras Lila. Mm -hmm. It would be impossible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are like the eternal devas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who are Nitya Parikars. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, when, when the Lila is taking place on earth, there are also earthly devas who, again, somehow get to have some glimpse of the whole thing, not in the same degree as the Parikard devas do. No? Because again, we, we are seeing here, Brahma, he's not a Nitya Parikar. He's a Sadaka. And he witnessed the picnic. Again, he didn't understood it and do some mis did some mischief, but... <laughs> He, he got to have some glimpse of that. But yeah, those devas who are witnessing very intimate pastimes uninterruptedly on, on earth even, they are the spiritual original versions of, of the devas. Yeah. Like in the beginning of the 10th canto, Krishna says to the cow, I will come, mm. but you all devas, you already take birth on earth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this means mm -hmm. when the Prakat Lila is coming, it must be a big event for all the devas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for yeah, sure. This is our chance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to Sri Jiva Goswami. So he began saying, in this verse Brahma glorifies, not solely in this verse, sorry, Brahma glorifies the people of Raj in five verses. So he will consider that from this verse, 33, Till 37, this constitutes a glorification of the Brajavasis by Brahma. I'll mention a few points from Jiva Goswami since he repeats many of the same points that Sanatana Goswami mentioned. Let's go for a minute back to this idea of the Devatas in the senses. Because again, Brahma is mentioning here, here that the deities of the senses are enjoying this nectar of Krishna's feet and so on. But it is mentioned; it's not mentioned anywhere that a presiding deity of a sense organ is the enjoyer, as Brahma seems to suggest here. From a literal viewpoint, this makes no sense. 
you follow the, 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 the devas are in the organs, but the ones who enjoy the experience is not the devas in themselves. They're just like facilitating the experience agents. for, yeah, exactly, agents. So Jiva Goswami will say that this is called Utpreksha Lak Alankar. Utpreksha Lank. Alankar means poetic ornamentations. So there is a whole separate department of poetry in Sanskrit which has many alankars. Alankar means again ornamentation. So there are many alankars. Then it's, and, and this one is called Utpreksha, which means fanciful imagination. <laughs> yeah. So although it's not happening, no, Brahma, the, the sense devatas are not enjoying directly, he presents them as if they are doing that. So although literally, technically, that is wrong, there is place for that in the context of Alankar in poetics. And then Jiva Goswami say that the word Ekada Saiva, which which can refer to the eleventh, can he say can also be separated as Eka Dasa Eva. And that means that the level of the Brajavasis Dasa can refer to that is Eka. Eka also means unique. <laughs> so the, the same word that refers to eleven devas can I speak about the level of the Brajavas in without parallel. And Dasha can also mean the point of the consciousness. So Eka Dash means mm -hmm. one point. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They don't see anything else. Exactly. Yeah, Vyasi Admo Kagraha, yeah. He will say something else, Jiva Goswami, about this. He says, since the cowherd, cowherds are spiritual associates of Krishna, they are endowed with all powers. Therefore, they do not need material devatas for their senses. Just as the deities of the, uh, of the rectum and the genitals were rejected before, for, for being vulgar, if you will, <laughs> he says the experience in the same way that was rejected <laughs> the experience of happiness derived from the cowherd senses by the material devatas should be rejected not like implying again material devatas cannot enter in touch with the transcendental senses of the Brajabhasis so what's that way of to explain this verse, Jiva Goswami says? Basically, Brahma here, Jiva Goswami says, is extolling the good fortune of, of his and of the deities because of getting a slight taste of Krishna's sweetness every here and now, here and then. Like again, they are not permanently residing in the sense of the Rajabhasis. But here and then they, they, they have a slight glance of what they are doing, like now in, on earth. But the implication with this is that the good fortune of the Rajabhasis is greater than theirs. And by saying this, Brahma strengthens his own ambition of that nature to enter there. So at the yeah, exactly, exactly. So the result of his respect is that he has more and more longing to go there. Now it's not that more distance is being created, but the distance is being bridged. Now the gap is being bridged. Or also, hmm, someone is leaving. <laughs> Okay, it oh, only seems so, I, uh, the, as we said the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Krishna goes to the forest and the body of the gopis remain there, only their bodies, but their minds go. So, no separation, it only seems so. Jai Gaurhari. Jai. Aho.
Yeah. So Jiva Goswami concludes his his commentary going back to Ekada Saiba. Ekada Saiba. Another word, another possibility for Ekada Saiba is the incomparable ten deities of the ten directions. No, because they are, they are deities of the different directions. So the idea with this is, he says, with the caps of our own respective eyes and so on, we, who are the ten devatas, the Dikpala, sometimes called Dikpala, protectors of the directions, we, we drink here and again, sometimes, the honey of your lotus feet. That is spreading this sweetness and that sweetness in the cowherd village. And to make again clear more his point, he quotes one verse from the Bhagavad and from the Yugal Gita. No, that will come later, of course, here. So Yugal Gita means after the Rasa Lila, Krishna is meeting the gopis every night. But now the gopis want to meet Krishna every day also. <laughs> it's not enough for them to meet Krishna for Rasa Lila every night. Now they want to meet him during the midday. So they, in the midday, start to sing, meditating what Krishna is doing at this moment of the day. And longing, longing to, to have that midday union. And it's interesting because after this Yugal Gita, Krishna is killing Aristasur. And after killing Aristasur, Shama Kunda Radha Kunda manifests. And after that, the, meet, the daily meeting and Radha Kunda midday manifests. <laughs> so the prayers of the gopis become real. <laughs> yeah. That's another serious Yugal Gita also. <laughs> So, verse 22 of the Jugal Gita, mm, the gopis are saying that Krishna's feet are praised in song by the gods as, as Krishna returns from the pastures. Mm, and in this verse also they say that Krishna plays his flute and all the devas becomes like mesmerized by the flute. Now, because the devas are known as very, very refined experts in arts and music and all this alankar, poetic ornamentation and rhythm and melody. They are the greatest artists. <laughs> well, when Krishna plays the flute, all the devas collapse. They cannot ascertain what's that rag, what's that, that melody and that tal and that... No? Gopi Gita, there's a similar verse, similar to the Gopi says, Surata Bhardhanam Shokanasanam Swarita Venunam Sustu Chunvitam Itara Ragavis Maranam Rinam Bitara Viranas Tedharamritam <laughs> So the gopis are glorifying Krishna's Adharamrita, which is the nectar of his lips, which can be, of course, many things. <laughs> his Mahaprasad, his remnants, hmm, his kissing, or his the flute sound. So in this verse, one meaning of the verse is, when Krishna is playing the flute, great personalities like the Devas, they forget everything about the Itara Raga Vis, all about Raga and Tal, melody and rhythm. They collapse, that's forgotten for them. Just by hearing Krishna's flute. So this verse from Jugal Gita says the same thing. And it's pointing to Krishna returning from the pastures. And the Devas having at that moment some darshan. And that, that's happening on earth. <coughs> so that's one of the examples how Brahma and other Devas, material Devas, can have a glimpse of this in the Prakat Lila. Okay. Let's conclude with Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Yes. Just my Yes. Uh, in Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary, Sagata Dajani, at ah. that moment, mm. he says these are also the spiritual devas. Mm. 
because this is such a festival when all the carol boys return in mm. the evening mm. and then they see and they it's a jolly atmosphere they had just a big bliss mm -hmm. and then the carol boys they point and they, oh, look this one beforehand yeah yeah only five had. it's a jolly atmosphere mm -hmm. and even maria shoda sees it and she's like she sees how all the devas worship their son yeah bring flowers mm -hmm. but she doesn't have an idea of Aishwarya yeah. she just thinks I'm so happy that they also love him yeah yeah so this is no Aishwarya but Vishwan Chaitanya says that they are also the spiritual devas but they will forget the rag and all the things they become nonetheless yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and that's always a perfect excuse to justify why Krishna is late always oh the devas are just worshipping him for a minute he will be right back in a few minutes <laughs> <coughs> so let's go to Sri Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary. That's considerably long, but very, very nice, very interesting. I will share some parts of it. Tamadis are repeated. So the intention of this verse is Brahma is saying the inhabitants of Braj also have made us the demigods very fortunate. So again, that's the intention of the verse, no? Brahma is pointing, we are fortunate because of them. So Brahma, Brahma is praying here, according to Vishwanath. What to speak of the fortune of the Brajavasis? We have become also fortunate. Uh, one second. Mm -hmm. So, who... Uh, I lost. Here, we have become also fortunate. Okay. Who can describe it? One second that I got out of... out of connection. This is back here. We are back. Okay. <coughs> so, Brahma says, Demigods like Shiva and I... We are the eleven deities in charge of the senses. Have become most fortunate through the senses of the Brajavasis. We have tasted the extremely intoxicating nectar of Krishna's lotus feet, which are especially sweet because of the sweet sound of his ankle bells. Now Brahma is pointing to an extra Vishwanatha or Thakur, an extra feature. Krishna's feet are, are, feet are sweet for many reasons, but especially he has sweet ankle bells, which sound sweetly. So those ankle bells make his feet especially sweet. In this way, Brahma expresses his determination to see, hear, touch, taste, smell, sing about, and massage the Lord. So, many services that many times the Sakas are performing for Krishna also. As we mentioned these days, they touch Krishna's feet, they massage his feet, they sing about him, and so on. <clears throat> so then with regard to the word Amrita Shaban, again, here, here, Brahma is speaking about the sweetness of Krishna's feet. This, this wine, it says Amrita Savan. It is nectar. This is a wine, but it's a sweet wine. No? Sometimes it's people drink drink wine in this world. That's not sweet. And generally, all these intoxicating beverages are not very tasty. Like, but this is a tasty one. No? Sometimes the, the word wine is being used. No? Similarly, this famous prayer of Srila Siddhar Maharaj praising God other Pandit. Nilam Bodhi Tati Sadasu Virahak Shep Pambitam Bandavam Srimad Bhagavati Katam Madhiraya Sanjeevayam Bhatiya. Madhiraya is another word for wine. No? God other Pandit is serving Mahaprabhu on the, in, 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 in Tota Gopinath giving Bhagavad Kata. 
he's giving Krishna the wine, Mahaprabhu, the wine of Bhagavad Gita, no? which is sweet, intoxicating. Amrita, giving, giver of new life, Asavam. Hmm? And interestingly, again, this is a wine, sometimes there are wines that are doing from flowers. But this wine is not coming from any flower except from one flower, which is lotus flower. Why? Because it's coming from Krishna's feet. Hmm? Krishna's feet are Krishna's lotus feet. So this is lotus wine. <laughs> which again is another type of alankar another type of poetic ornamentation and generally you don't you don't derive wine from feet <laughs> no? indeed to, to stop for a minute here in this particular verse it's like this verse is like over the top and very high not only from the devotional point of view <clears throat> but even from a literary point of view no? Kavi Karnapur, he wrote one book called Alankar Kaustu, which is a book of poetic ornamentation. And a verse like this, the one we are studying today, according to, to Kavi Karnapur, will be classified like Uttam Uttam Kabya, which means like super excellent poetry, the highest of the highest. And why? Because there's a multitude of metaphors in this verse. Mm -hmm. For example, this one that we mentioned. We drink the honey of the feet. Mm -hmm. That's called technically Viroda Alankara. Viroda Alankara means like, Viroda means like a contradictory. So there is a semblance of a contradiction, but that helps to, to ornament the description. Or remember that the one we mentioned with the Utpreksha Alankara, the fanciful imagination of the. Or when we say Ekadashaiva, like a play of words, can be only 11, or can be the very unique position of the Rajavasis. And many others, no? There are many, many features in this verse that make it for a very high expression of poet, poetry. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur continues saying, something else should be considered here. <clears throat> he mentions something about the material senses. The material senses cannot act independently. Only by the sanction and power of the demigods <clears throat> can the material senses experience material objects. <clears throat> But Krishna's eternal associates independently experience the Lord's form and sound by their own spiritual senses, without any influence of mundane demigods. <clears throat> However, in his enthusiasm, Brahma identified his power to control material intelligence with the senses of the inhabitants of Raj. <clears throat> so remember, Brahma is the deity of material buddhi, or intellect. So one meaning could be, in his enthusiasm, he kind of mixed the two and compared himself with those. No. <laughs> Not because he is one of them, but because of, again, some ecstatic expression. Then, when Brahma here is saying he's drinking the nectar, remember? But we already said that devas are all instrumental, are not experiencers. No, like if you are taking soup with a spoon, the spoon is facilitating, but the spoon is not tasting the soup. Hmm? Purusha is the experience, no? <clears throat> so we could say that Brahma is kind of identifying himself or mixing these two things. <clears throat> not, not because he is drinking the nectar, but he's just thinking about his role, and that makes Brahma happy or proud. Oh, I'm one of those deities belonging to the senses, and somehow there is some connection with that. Now again, Brahma, this Brahma is not the Brahma of Golok, but somehow he has the same name as the Brahma of Golok. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So somehow. It's like he, he follows, so he becomes happy and proud 
Oh, I'm also Brahma. <laughs> no? Like, for example, if you are Jai Haribo. See you soon. Yes, yes. Oh, Haribo. It's okay. <laughs> You can imagine how it works for me after every two weeks I'm experiencing all the situations going from one place to another. No? Union in separation, union in separation, union. <laughs> but it's every day. Okay. <laughs> I have not reached that standard yet. <laughs> so anyhow, we could say that, no? Like Brahma is happy. I'm not like the Brahma of Golok, but I have the same name. Uh, we have a similar function. So he becomes like, ah, oh, proud, in, in a good way. Not like if someone in this world is called, whatever, John Smith. <laughs> and suddenly there is someone who becomes very famous and is known as John Smith. No? So you feel, oh, I have the same name as that person, John Smith. <laughs> Although nobody knows you. <laughs> no, everyone knows that John Smith. But somehow you feel... There is Nam Samya with some similarity in name. That his name has some power. No. <laughs> so somehow we can explain that also, why Brahma is in the somehow mixing everything. <clears throat> and Vishwanachakra Thakur concludes his purport. And he says, there is another one meaning of this verse. Sometimes the devotee will praise his own good fortune out of greediness to taste the Lord's sweetness. Greediness to taste the sweetness of the Lord. Not so much because of mundane pride, I'm so... Mm -hmm. But because he wants to taste something. Mm -hmm. So Brahman is saying here, the good fortune of the inhabitants of Braj is incomparable. But then Brahma will say, but we, the demigods, are also very fortunate. Why? And then Vishwanath Thakur says that Brahma, with his finger, touches his eyes and ears. And he says, he will say, with these senses, we also experience your beauty, to Krishna, he's saying, and sweetness, as you leave Raj to herd the calves. So again, Brahma is praising his own good fortune out of greediness to taste that even more. You follow? So the Brajavas are the most fortunate. We are also very fortunate because of this. But this, this is said in context of greediness of becoming that most fortunate that the Brajavas are. And then one little line from Srinath Chakrabarti. Yeah. 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 So he says, he paraphrases Brahma. Oh. He says, let the, let the greatness of the Brajavasi's good fortune be so. In other words, Brahma is saying, let it remain out of our reach. Because it is foremost supreme and it's not a normal condition. Not normal in the sense of it's too much. So here Brahma, according to Srinath Chakravarti, may be like invaded by a feeling of humility. So he says, let their fortune be what it is. It's out of our reach. It's too much for us. No? It's not normal condition. It's super transcendental. Hmm? So in this in this spirit of humility, Brahma will continue in the next verse. Okay. In the very next verse, he will fully he will famous. It's a famous verse where Brahma will be praying. Yeah, exactly. To he will speak about Bhuri Bhagyam again, which means which will be my greatest good fortune. And Brahma will pray asking for any birth in Braj. Yeah, but as we already explained, it's not that Brahma wants any birth. <laughs> he wants a particular birth. <laughs> he wants to be a, a gopa, a saka. 
but he's being invaded by humility here. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, he will say, any birth here, so I can receive the dust from the feet of the Brajabasis, although he has some Brajabasis in mind by saying that. <coughs> so we will continue explaining that tomorrow. And this is because he received the seed by when uh, Lord Krishna gave him the hand mm -hmm. as a saka. Yeah, that was the initial some scar, we will say, no, like impression, impact. So that started to create in him like an experience. Oh, this is it's possible again. It's possible because first Krishna related, Brahma related to Krishna in the beginning of creation, like my guru, my father, with more Aishvarya, no, like more a sense of reverence. Krishna is instructing him, speaking Chatur Shloki. So disciple is, I mean, disciple is to have some reverence for the for the guru. But also, interestingly, to say Bishram Bina Guru Seva, one has to have some type of confidence and friendship in relation with the Guru. Gradually, that has to build in that direction. No? In the beginning, it may be more like Aishwarik. But then, on the foundation of that reverence, some friendship has to develop. So, first, Brahma was having this Aishwarik connection with his Guru, Krishna. But then his guru mm, shake hands. So he had like, oh, this is possible also. It feels so nice. Not only to be friends with, like one is with the guru on some level, but he got like a first, again, impression of what all, what, all types of, how to say, how, how much more friendship one could have with Krishna. <laughs> it all began with the shaking of the hands. <laughs> But now he Brahma is realizing, oh, how much how much one can one can become a friend of Krishna. Mm -hmm. After he saw the picnic and all the things, so he's like, yeah. I want that. Oh, 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 oh. And the shaking of the hand, when uh, when was it? Before, bef uh, or after? After uh, before what? Before or after what? <laughs> <laughs> When when he saw when he saw Krishna um, behaving in the picnic. No 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 that that was before that. That, that was before. Yeah yeah this was at the very beginning of of, of Brahma's life, oh. very beginning of Brahma's life, this happened, and then almost like half a life half half Brahma's life passed, and then came the picnic. So he has his shaking of hands, and for half of his life he was mm. practicing and and culturing that develop that desire and then he had the chance of seeing this picnic but there was much more that shaking of the hands <laughs> with the hands they were doing other things left hand feeding Krishna the, in the picnic <laughs> and Brahma was wow this is not only about shaking hands here they're embracing each other they are rest with their hands the Gopas are wrestling Krishna to the ground <laughs> So much more you can do with your hands with as a friend of Krishna. <laughs> so Brahma became, yes, 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 I want that. He further confirmed that desire. But again, some humility comes in between because remember he did some mischief some minutes ago. He kidnapped the boy. So he's like, this so high, but who I am? This so high, but I'm so low. So all this mixture of emotions will give rise to verses like the one we'll see tomorrow. But Brahma will say, let me at least birth, be born anywhere in Brindavan, but receive the dust from their feet. So that, that will give me hope to attain what I really want someday. But we could say that this mischief he did is not really a mischief because he um, favored somehow a lila of Krishna, which is this great one of yeah, yeah, yeah. expanding yeah, yeah, yeah. many years and many yeah, yeah, yeah. months. Uh, but he himself feels like that personally. No? We are not pointing at Brahma. You are an aparadi, you are an offender. He was just, he wanted Sakyarasa. And then when he was shown all that Sakyarasa was, he couldn't accommodate that. <laughs> and he tried, he, re, he acted in a certain way in his astonishment. We won't say he was an offender, but in his humility feels, I offended Krishna's form, friends, and so on. Although he was being in instrumental in facilitating 
to the Batsalyaras, the cows, the mothers, and so many things were happening at the same time. No? So, <laughs> but that's his own humility, no? That w that will help him to get closer to his goal, actually, no? So there is place for that also. But still, Vishwanath Thakur says, oh, after Govardhan Lila, Indra spoke 11 verses. Mm -hmm. And Krishna embraced him, that it's, everything is fine. Mm. Because this Leela was intended to bring Krishna and the Prashpasis together. Mm -hmm. But Brahma Vimohan Leela, he couldn't succeed. Brahma couldn't even touch the eternal coward friends. But he stole a material illusion. But it was still the intention of separating Krishna and his devotee. After these 40 verses, he was not really pleased. He was not embracing him. So there was some difference, but of course, you know, it's yeah. a key plan for his Sakya Bhav. Exactly, exactly. Some questions before yes. finishing? Yeah. You have a question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah this morning mm, when I was chanting, I was thinking about the story of Brahma and um, that he was the first born son and then how he had this desire to feel the Saka mm, but, and then I was thinking about Vrindavan and that Krishna wants to mm, experience all these different loves like the, the, the love with his friends the maternal love the romantic love, but then also the love that he receives from his parents. Um, and then I was suddenly thinking that um, someone I think told me that um, in Vrindavan he has these different ages, and um, but it ends like at 17 or 16, something like that. And then I was wondering, because I was thinking before of Brahma, who was the son, I'm like, why in Vrindavan there's not the next um, episode where he can experience the love, the parental love, but where he is the parent and the love that he would have towards a son or a daughter. I don't is that just not fit this? Vrindavan, this kind of love, you know, that that's the only love that he cannot experience in let me, let me repeat something to see if I understood the questions. Mm -hmm. The last part I want to confirm. Your, your question is, wh why or there is no chance for Krishna to be the father mm -hmm. and to experience others, the both has been Krishna's children, basically, sons, daughters. Yeah, well, we will say in this connection is that Krishna experiences that, but mostly in Dwarka. Yeah, in Dwarka, no? no. Eternally. No, not only on earth. Because Krishna, there is an eternal Dwarka, mm -hmm. eternal Mathura, and eternal Vrindavan. These are three divisions of Golok. Golok Dwarka, Golok Mathura, Golok Vrindavan. And also we will speak about Golok Navadvip. No? <laughs> So the point is that the Krishna experiences all the rasas or all the moods doesn't mean that all those rasas are experienced only in Vrindavan. No, in the sense of what, what he experiences as a Ramachandra in Ayodhya, that's happening in Ayodhya as Ramachandra. No? <laughs> the very unique form of Dasya or whatever he experiences there is not in Vrindavan because in Vrindavan there is not Ramachandra. No? So my point is, it's not that all of, all of the experiences are only limited to the form of Krishna in Vrindavan. Of course, in, in, in a general way, Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, Madhuri are experienced with him in Vrindavan, Charibhav. And also something that sometimes it is said is that the idea of Krishna being the father, if you will, or inverted Vatsalya, <laughs> has to do more with a relationship in which 
uh, how to say, the, the, the child is generally the one who is the dependent one. Mm -hmm. So if Krishna becomes the father, the child is more kind of the dependent one. But in Vrindavan, Krishna likes more to be him, the dependent one. No? So that's why he, he prefers that side of the Vatsali equation. No? Let me be the son of Jashoda Nanda. Let, let me taste this full dependence. Being nourished by them. Hmm? But on another degree, he will taste the other side, but outside of Vrindavan, when there's not... The intensity of dependence is not that, that much, if you will. So then he will be a father, a grandfather, all these, if you will, more diluted exper experiences. But if you want to speak about Vatsalya, because that's Vatsalya what you are asking about. So in Vrindavan you find, again, the Dasya of Ramachandra is not in Vrindavan. But in Vrindavan there is a Dasya, which is more intense than the one in Ayodhya. So again, in Vatsalya, the Vatsalya of Dwarka is not in Vrindavan. But the Vatsalya in Vrindavan is the most intense form of Vatsalya, <laughs> in which Krishna is the, the, the child. So in Vrindavan we only find the most intense versions <laughs> of each one of these main rasas. Dasya, Sakya, Vatsalya, and Madhurya. There is Madhurya somewhere else, as we mentioned, Lakshmi, Rukmini, Sita. There is Vatsalya somewhere else, of, of the two types. But all these rasas find their most intense expression in Vrindavan. So that's why we could say mostly Krishna is, chooses to be always the son of the <laughs> and not the the father, if you will. No? Krishna Chandra. Just, you know, in, just a little... Um one little point. Yes. Uh, if you allow. Please. Uh, and not little, big one. No, no. <laughs> Just, um, Rupa Goswami says, the Rasa experience is always, Krishna is always the Vishay of all Rasas. Mm -hmm. So, this means when he is like the father, so the soul, how he looks like, oh, he, I'm maintained by him and mm -hmm. he's like, He's like my Lord. Mm -hmm. So then actually it's like Maharaja, then it's Dasya Ras. It's not Vatsalya Ras. Mm -hmm. So this is a, it's a, it's mm -hmm. a different experience. Mm -hmm. Like many people think, or oh, like in Christianity you have this mm -hmm. Bab very strongly, mm -hmm. or oh, his mm -hmm. the Father, but this is not Vatsalya, this is only Dasya mm -hmm. Ras. Because one has always to look, the Rasa is from the soul to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Of course, he experiences so many varieties. Mm -hmm. But just to be the one like Buddha Bhavana, Krishna says in Gita many times, I am the maintainer of everything mm. in this world and I maintain all souls. This is nice. But. <laughs> <laughs> but he himself, to be under a mother and being, you know, fed. Uh. The one who feeds everyone is fed. That's what we yeah. Shoda. The experience for him is million, million times more intense. Mm -hmm. so yeah, like poshana, this type of ideas of being yeah. nourished and being... Or mm -hmm. being chastised and corrected. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. He's the one, Dharmantu Sakshat Bhagavat Pranita. Mm -hmm. He is, whatever he says, is the eternal law. But now, he is corrected... <laughs> By Mother Yashoda, and this experience is millions of millions of times more intense. Mm. So, in this way, one cannot say, Oh, he experiences it, but Ras. Actually, yeah. it's only it yeah. he does your mm -hmm. And we could, if you want to ask some extra layer, <laughs> <laughs> we, we could say that, I mean, for Krishna to have ch children in Vrindavan, first he has to be married with someone. Mm -hmm. But Krishna won't, Parakya is, is affected there now. So Krishna, again, the, the topmost version of Madhurya is Parakya. So, so we could say that in, in that section of Vrindavan we are pointing, Krishna won't, won't be married, basically. And so we can continue adding with our Gaudiya bias and lens in that direction. <laughs> Something else before but concluding? But in Padaka, uh, Krishna has to. Yes. So there is place for that. If someone wants that, there is place for that. 
that. Yeah, that's the point. That's that's why the first thing I say was that. Yeah. No? It's not that there is no place at all, but we try to explain why there is no place for that in Brindavan, because the question more most most more in that connection. But yeah, one if we would like one would like to experience that with him, that's possible. <coughs> I know one very advanced Gaudiya still alive in the planet and and his interesting realization <laughs> okay we are si- <laughs> we we, can, we we cannot be speaking about a, a different person because yeah uh, his realization is that he is a grandson of krishna in dwarka mm-hmm. which is, again is kind of an exception to the rule because in Gaudiya sampradaya generally as we mentioned there are certain main focuses and currents. No? Vrindavan, Madhurya Bhav, or Sakya Bhav as a supporting role. But generally, Dwarka is not in the picture, or Ayodhya. Or, but sometimes we will find some very exceptional cases that take shelter in Mahaprabhu, and they can attain their ultimate goal by Mahaprabhu's Yuga Dharma. So there's place, and that's nice to meet those cases. <laughs> That will be confidential. This is we have a book here, okay. Okay, okay. Then, then, then we will we'll, we'll go in that direction. Maharaj, uh, yes. one thing more uh, about the Devas mm. and their entry in Vrindavan and the commentaries were like hinting a little but there's like so many verses like Kasyana Bhavata Deva Vitmahe like not even Lakshmi has ever access <coughs> to Vrindavan. <coughs> so what to speak, like Hemudignaya, what to speak of material devas. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so I'm just wondering, um, it must be that the experience that Brahma is like mentioning in this world, this is really... Um, uh, like a glorification. Mm-hmm. It's not that they can, when even Lakshmi cannot enter, mm-hmm. they really must be far away. Mm-hmm. But maybe just um, like a worship of them. But how, but then the point is, we know that Brahma here is, he is there. Have, he's there dar, having the arshan of Krishna, and yeah. so we cannot deny that fact. Yeah. yeah. No? So, yeah. <laughs> but I will, I will, Mention what you mentioned, yeah, like, like. <coughs> of course, the main, the main point and the main glorification and emphasis is to those devas. Isn't devas and of course, generally, when we hear about Lakshmi not being able to enter, <laughs> sometimes the main emphasis is she cannot enter the Rasa Lila. <laughs> of course, sometimes it is also say she cannot access Vrindavan. <laughs> but sometimes we hear these stories: she's in Belvan doing <laughs> tapasya. <laughs> So you can say, she entered Vrindavan. And Krishna met her. As maybe you know the story, but I will make it briefly short. So Lakshmi at one point wanted to enter Rasa Lila. No, and Lakshmi generally is called, like she's always, Chanchala or many other names. Chanchala means uns- not moving too much. But this refers to the form of of Lakshmi as in this world, one example is that Lakshmi in this world means it always goes from one pocket to another. Huh? Mm-hmm. So it's always moving. It's unsteady. But she's always fixed in one direction. Serving the feet of Narayan. She cannot move from there. She may move a lot in the other form, <laughs> but she cannot move in serving Pada Sevanam. She's the, the form of Pada Sevanam. But one day, this Lakshmi, who is the very personification of chastity, she wanted to join Rasa Lila. This is what Mahaprabhu asked uh, Venkatavata in South India. Uh, Venkatavata was the main priest of Sri Rangam, Sri Sampradaya, worshippers of Lakshmi Narayana. <laughs> and Mahaprabhu is asking go, uh, Venkatavata, but if you worship Lakshmi Narayan, right? Yes. No? 
Mahaprabhu said, but, but if Lakshmi is so chaste to Narayan, why she wanted to run with Krishna in Rasa Lila? Uh, Mahaprabhu was kind of jolly joking with him. And, and, and Bhinkata Bhattu said, well, in Tattva there is no difference between Narayan and Krishna. They are the same person, actually. So it's not that Lakshmi is cheating Narayan and going with someone else. It's the same person. So she's still chaste. <laughs> but then Mahaprabhu said, well, why she was not able to join Rasalina? And when Katawata was like, well, I ne- only, on, I ho- only someone who can think of that question can answer that question, he said. <laughs> I don't know, you tell me. So the story goes that Lakshmi went to Belvan, which is one of the twelve forests of Vrindavan, and she was engaging in extreme penance, tapasya. Try to imagine, Lakshmi is like the ideal royal lady. Whatever she eats is cooked in ghee, everything paka. <laughs> and here he's, she's eating roots from the forest. And she's wearing like a white sari, like with holes doing tapasya, who is the goddess of fortune. I'm trying to imagine a queen, how she wears all the ornaments, and now she's just with one. So Krishna is in Vrindavan one day and she sees Lakshmi in that situation. And she asks Lakshmi, Lakshmi, what are you doing like this? And she says, I want to enter Rasa Lila. I heard about the glories of that and, and I want to participate. And Krishna says, but this is not the way to enter Rasa Lila. No? Tapasya is not the way to Bhakti. Oh, Lakshmi says, so what's, what, what should I do? <laughs> My Guru Maharaj likes to tell that very very funny way. <laughs> Krishna will say, that's very easy. First you have to leave your husband. Narayan. Just when Lakshmi hears that, almost she collapses. <laughs> oh, leaving Narayan, she cannot conceive. No? That's her identity. But that was just the first step. Because at first you have to leave your, your husband. Then you have to marry one Gopa and bring down. And then you have to leave him and join me. <laughs> oh, in Parakia. But this was too much for Lakshmi. It was beyond her Abhiman, her own sense of identity as Lakshmi. So it is said that she couldn't ever join Rasa Lila. Because she was not able to, to practice Raga Nuga Bhajan, basically. <laughs> So in that sense we could say she entered Vrindavan but she she was not able to intimately witness and participate in, in those lilas. So, so similarly we can say someone like Brahma got a glimpse saw, saw something of that at a distance <laughs> but that's not the same type of participation and darshan that the eternal devas will, will have. Yeah. Anyhow, some thoughts about that. Hope that helps. Yes. No, no, no. You are cheating me for the last half an hour. One, one little question. One question. And I, and I even started to even uh, to know his. He's like, his mood is so. he starts to do like this and say, okay, we have two more hours now. Yeah. He's testing. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Whenever whenever sadhus are there, you have to milk them. And he mm. makes like this gesture, like mm. the little cow. Mm. When he's going to the udder of the cow, he cannot just drink. You have to do like this uh-huh. until the milk is coming. So yeah. it's not just wait, you know. And you have to do your 50%. <laughs> 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 As a calf. Maharaj, I'm just a... (laughs) (laughs) Coming down a little. Um, What do you think? When a person is doing bhajan here, in this world, and chanting and absorbing, 
what we do now, Harikata. So in our senses are the devas because we are like worldly being. I imagine oh. what's the question, but continue. Uh, are they happy? <laughs> are they happy? Yes. Or and are they also when we sometimes Krishna says in the beginning of Gita, oh in the you know, you should be in harmony and also with the devas you should please them so is this also a way of pleasing them and getting some benedictions of even the devas yeah totally yeah that that's why as we said the other day <coughs> worshiping krishna is like krishna. watering the root of the tree and we could see some of the 33 million branches of the tree <laughs> are the 33 million devas so if you go to the root it's one of the devas you're receiving their own. Oh, huh? the because remember, the devas are bhaktas. Huh? Most of them are described as sakam bhaktas. Devotees with some, still some material desire. But devotees at the, at the end of the day. So if someone is a devotee, they will be happy to be in, in their proximity. What to speak if someone is a, wants to become a nishkam bhakta? The body free from material desires. The devas are sakam bhaktas, but they will appreciate the nishkam bhakti. No? So, so yeah, that will attract all this, these blessings and benedictions, and that's why also it is said, um, how this goes this verse, haruva bhaktasya kutumahat guna. How was the first line? Manoti rasyasti bhakti bhagavati kinchana. Uh, tatrati, what is Anyhow, that verse, which says that a devotee of mine, Krishna say, develops all the attributes of the de of the devas. Of course, this doesn't mean that he becomes only as good as the devas. <laughs> but we could say that the meaning of this, of developing the attributes of the devas, is all the devas are totally happy and blessing that devotee. With, what, with whatever they have, but those devotees will go even beyond that, if you will. So yeah, that, that, that will be the best way, the most comprehensive way of worshipping the devas. No? We don't need to do that separately, but it's important for us to understand how that's, how that's taking place in, in our worship of Krishna. Because like a desperate person, he needs the help of each and every one. Mm. You know, in one song, he said, yeah. you know, I'm Magibo Kripa Ralesh, I'm going, mm. and even from the mm. hands of Prindavan, I'm mm. bowing down. So maybe also from the devas, you know. I'm, so there is I'm place for that type of yeah humility and prayer in such a way that it's not apasidant, if you will. Because one can also worship the devas without that humility. <laughs> And that will be something counterproductive for your bhakti. So that will be more like, yeah, Kanishtan Uttam, like we always say, Kanishtan Uttam may be seen doing the same things, <laughs> but from a different, very different perspective. So Kanishtan may be worshipping the devas without proper sambanda, and an Uttam may be worship, begging, crying to the devas. <laughs> Uh, from a very different place. <laughs> so that's very important to always not judge devotees from what they are doing externally, from, but from which is their internal conception of that. That will protect us from not imitating them, but following their footsteps. That's the difference between Anukar and Anusar. So... Thanks for the... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we can conclude here today and tomorrow we have yet another verse and yet another verse. Shri La Gurudev Ki Jai, Shri Man Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Shri Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai, Shri Shri Gorgadhadar Tu Ki Jai, Shri Radha Govind Ki Jai, Nantara Shri Mad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, <clears throat> Shri Brahma Stuti Ki Jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki Jai, Gaur Praman Haribo. Haribo.